today, I know that you like modern cars, and we're riding in a very modern car, are we not? It is a modern car from 1910. This is probably one of the greatest and one of the most forgotten cars of all time. It's called the American Underslung. This is a 1910 model. Uh, I think the first thing people notice are the huge wheels, which are 40-inch wheels, fine, fine tires. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, and yet the whole idea was to get the car lower. There was a guy named, I think, Frank Tome was, his, was the engineer, and they were delivering chassis to the factory, and they delivered them upside down, and he thought, hey, you know, we can make the car lower by just putting the chassis upside down. That's basically what they did. They used the wheels to bring it up, but they kept all the weight and the center of gravity low to make for a great handling automobile. Exactly, and also it's very interesting that there was a design aspect to that as well. You realize until the 1950s, you did not see a car with the hood lower than the fenders. Right, right. It really was a unique look. And these 40-inch tires, actually, it's not a gimmick. You know, they actually, at speed, they act as gyroscopes and sort of keep the car centered. I mean, it, it really does work. It, it drives like a much later car. This is 1910. 1910, and it's also amazing to think about the other aspects of the technology of this car, the specification. It's got a transaxle. Right. Now, the transaxle was invented by Harry Stutz, who I think designed the car, but I'm not sure. Yes, he was a But Harry Stutz was a brilliant engineer. He invented the transaxle. And what that means is, a transaxle is where the transmission is at the back of the car. You know, most cars, especially this period, had, had the engine, transmission, and then rear end. What Harry did was you had the engine, the trans then you had the drive shaft, then the transmission at the very back. So you got a good, you got a good balance of uh, front and rear wheel weight. And that also helps, obviously, the handling and uh, balance of the car, especially at a time when this car was built, when roads were often just simply ruts yeah. that you had to follow. So to have as much balance and control of the car as possible really make an advantage in terms of driving conditions. Right. Also, you know, on, on most modern cars you have, especially rear wheel drive, you have transmission tunnel because the, the body's put down, literally laid over the mechanical part and the mechanical part sort of stick up into the butt. That's what this does. If you look in this back seat, you'll see the transmission tunnel going right into the rear end. Most cars are so high that you always had a flat floor. And I'm actually sitting much lower than I think I would in any other car from this period. Yeah, it's also an interesting thing because aesthetically, and, and I'm really drawn to the design of cars, this also is an incredibly pleasing design because of the way it's built. Right. Uh, especially for the period. The car looks very sleek, it looks very elegant, it looks very sporty, uh, simply because of the aspect of the tires to the body uh, and the uh, running gear. I don't understand why it was not successful. They were out of business by 13. You know, a lot of people don't realize there were over 350 American manufacturers in the team. It was kind of like the early day of the computer industry. Dell made one part, Microsoft made something else, and then eventually they all went, hey, why are we using other people's stuff? Let's make the whole thing ourselves. That's what Harry Stutz did, hence the, the Stutz automobile, which ran for about, I don't know, 20 years, something like that. And uh, it's also, I think, one of the things that uh, may have contributed to Americans' demise was the fact that, unlike their competitors, they didn't really go racing. No. And no. racing really proved the brands, right. especially with brands like Stutz and, and Mercer. I mean, they really made an effort to show the durability and, uh, and reliability of their cars through competition. The engine is typical of the period. I know when they first started to design these, they thought they'd use a Continental engine or, you know, buy somebody else's motor. But Continental was so busy, had so much work, they couldn't afford to sell them anymore. So, What's also interesting about uh, this car is that in a time when a lot of manufacturers went for absolutely huge engines, you know, this is a uh, 500 uh, cubic inch L head uh, inline four. And those provide a lot of torque, but not a lot of rev. Right. I think 1250 is the end of the world and, and, and the rev limit. And it also provides a level of performance that is perfect for conditions around here. Oh yeah. Cruising down two lane roads, here next to the ocean in Newport is just absolutely amazing, ideal environment for this car. Yeah, yeah, it really is, it really is. And it'll also be very interesting to see the house that we're going to right now, because it too 
is an example of great modernity at the turn of the century. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask what modernity means. Modernity means something which is modern. Oh, oh, mod oh, oh. Modernity. All right, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Let me see. If we're playing Scrabble, I guess I would have to accept that, wouldn't I? And I'd get a triple letter score as well. You would well, get a triple sure, letter yeah. score. If I can yeah, figure out a modernity an accent. here is really good. <laughs> the level, the coefficient <laughs> of modernity. Ah, that's a good one. Yeah. People talk about the coefficient of drag and all that. Yeah. Well, let, let's invent the Leno Osborne coefficient of modernity. To me, the most fun about old cars like this are the gauges. On the dashboard, you'll see <clears throat> oil circling. What, what this has is little cups that pick up oil and just throw it all over the internals of the car. And you can see the oil flowing right down there on the floor. You just look down and okay, oil is still flowing. It's not oil pressure, it's just oil circulation. Oil circulation. Yeah. And when that stops doing that, you want to you want stop to the up. car. Yeah, yeah. A very early version of the check engine light. Right, yeah, exactly. Exactly. At least this car has all kinds of features we take for granted now, you had to hand pump the fuel. By that I mean the fuel tank is pressurized. So you pump it up and the, and the fuel would be forced to go forward to the carburetor. And then there's a little internal pump on the end of the engine that keeps the, uh, the pressure up. Which is why so many manufacturers for so long stuck with gravity fed right. tanks. So they didn't have to deal with the pressurization issues. It's also a very comfortable car to ride in because of the design of this windshield. Right. There's no buffeting at all. You get a nice airflow, but you don't have that need to wear goggles. So I'm sure there's also a very, very comfortable car for the uh, affluence of the time because you weren't really thrashed around in the car like you were in many cars. But it had series. sporting pretensions. You can turn this windshield down and just be open air if you like. Al fresco, I believe. Al fresco, exactly. Uh, yeah. I remember him. You know, I school a nice him. guy, Al fresco. <laughs> Terrific yeah. guy, yeah. The other interesting thing this car does not have is a motometer, which is the temperature gauge ah, on the yes. radiator. You really have no idea what the, uh, you won't know until you're boiling over, basically, whether the car is running hot or not. Well, I think the idea was just keep moving. Yeah, the as idea long was you just, just to keep, keep moving. moving. And a lot of times it showed, oh no, our car will not overheat. There was no need for that, you know. <laughs> but for most people, it was an accessory they liked to have just to know the temperature of the automobile. Peace of mind in motoring is something that uh, you can never get too much of, especially we can only imagine what it was like to take a car like this out for a long drive. There's a reason why this car has dual spares, because uh, blowouts were quite common. Quite common. And if you went on a, a trip of 20 or 30 miles, it's quite likely that you had to change the time. I love the Warner Spinometer. That's before he met Stuart. Yes. It was just not Stuart Warner, it's just Warner Spinometers. So, Donald, what house are we going to? Well, Jay, we're headed to a simply wonderful estate called Wildacre. And as you'll see, all of today's selections will celebrate usable performance. Well, this is a great place. See, I like my houses like English muffins. A lot of nooks and crannies. You know, how they, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And this has all kinds of gables and nooks and crannies. It's really cool. I, I, I like cozy little places, you know? It's an amazing house, Jay. And Wildacre is also very unusual for Newport because it was designed by a California architect. Irving Gill was based in San Diego. And this house actually has a lot of aspects of the Southern California bungalow style, but perfectly sits in this site here in Newport on a beautiful cove. It was built for Albert Olmsted, the half-brother of Frederick Law Olmsted, the great landscape architect. Of course, right. he designed Central Park, among other things. And this house has a lot of the West Coast influence in terms of the setting, the pines, the Japanese gardens. Right. And it's a wonderful mixture of the traditional and the modern. The modern, which was then, of course, was arts and crafts. Right. And in fact, this is one of the most traditional houses that Irving Gill built in this period because after that, he went to a much more modernist language. Yeah. Flat roofs, um, very, very, what we would think of as sort of almost uh, prairie modern. And what in year Southern was it built? 1902. Now, see, I would have guessed this was built in the 70s or something, maybe, maybe late 60s. I would never have guessed 1902 because so many of the other houses here have that gilded cottage, you know, they look like castles and uh, made of stone. Uh, 
this looks like a modern home. This looks like it was built, if you told me this was built 12 years ago, I would have believed you. Well, it's also, <clears throat> again, um, Gill was a modernist, even in his time. And the way that he, unlike a lot of the other big houses here in Newport, he cited this house to be a part of the landscape. And as we see around the property, the way this sits on a cove, the house is shaped to match the shape of the cove. Right. And there are gardens on either side, and it's very, very private, very, very quiet. The, the uh, plantings are designed to be very lush and to give also lots of outdoor uh, sort of sitting rooms yeah. and relaxation spots. You know, it's funny, you say modern. When I think of modern, I think of flying buttresses and, you know, big glass walls and, you know, roofs that do this. They, they don't look comfortable to me. They look like hospitals for stereo equipment. They're just sort of white and, you know, whereas this, I mean, uh, I would not call this modern. This seems traditional. It's modern for the time. Think yeah, 1902. I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. And also, right. again, many houses that were built on the ocean here are very enclosed. This house is very open to the ocean and the water views, right, which right. makes it quite special. And again, very much like our 1910 Underslung, a car that's very modern for its day. This is a house that was very modern for its time in 1902. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, this car looks perfect parked in front of it. I mean, if this is a black and white sort of what they call a tin type photo, it would look like it was taken in period. Exactly. Yeah, really something. Very nice. Very nice. Now, thinking about design and the purity of design and what it means, the next car we have is this 1968 Ferrari 330 GTC. Let's take a look. Ferrari introduced the 275 GTC in 1966. It was a more conservative alternative to the 275 GTB, right. a very sporting two-seater Ferrari. And uh, it's interesting because this is the first Ferrari that was really designed as a two-seater for the gentleman's express market, as opposed to the two plus twos. Well, I remember I, I was a kid. This is my favorite vintage Ferrari, because when I worked at Foreign Motors in Boston back in the late 60s and early 70s, we got one of these in trade. Uh, I think we gave the guy 5500 for it. We sold it for a little over $7,000. My boss thought, oh my God, <laughs> that no one is ever going to make that much money on a, on a trade-in. But it was the first Ferrari to have, at least I remember, to have air conditioning, radio, all the creature comforts. I mean, all Ferraris up to this point were kind of race cars for the road. This was a road car with sort of race car pedigree. Exactly. And it was also designed in a way to be very quiet and very elegant in a way that people didn't actually expect from a Ferrari at this point. And it's also quite interesting, this one, the 330, the four liter version of the car, was in direct response to Lamborghini. Lamborghini had come out with the 350 right. GT and then the 400 GT, and to compete with the four liter engine in the Lamborghini, Ferrari had to increase the size of the engine, and the 330s are amazing performers. Well, not to be insulting, but if, if the Italians designed a Mustang, this is what it would look like, sort of long hood, short deck, you know, this whole deal. The, ti the tires are exactly the right size. And these were huge tires back in the day. Absolutely, and yeah. I think that the comparison to the Mustang is not an insult, because first of all, I think the Mustang is one right. of the best designs ever. It truly expresses the, the, the use of the car. And this car was criticized a bit in its day because of its similarity in design to the Fiat 124, right. which is not a criticism of the Ferrari or the Fiat. They're both beautiful, timeless designs. Just very simple, very classic, very elegant. And today, this car looks amazingly modern and yet very much of the period. Of course, at all the cues of the period, the gated shifter, which was the huge selling point. You know, it sort of it was like it was like a rifle bolt. You, you sort exactly. of cocked snick, it, you know. Snick. Yeah, and it just clicks right in. And and the air conditioning was kind of. I mean, you it kept you from getting hot. No, it you, didn't cool you off. Yeah, you couldn't beat Americans for air conditioning and heating. That was something we always did tremendously well. Since the 40s, you turn on any air conditioner, you're freezing in minutes. Whereas each time, maybe at night, it might cool, but sun coming in, it would just be sort of a breeze. You, know? you have opening vent windows. What yeah. do you need? Yeah, exactly. And the Ferrari exactly. V12. You can go fast enough to keep yourself cool. And it's funny how the engine looks so simple now, but back in the day, it seemed so incredibly com complex, you know? You had the twin, this has twin distributors, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Had the twin distributors. You go, oh my God, how do you tune this thing? You know, uh, it's amazing. Just a beautiful, beautiful automobile. Absolutely astonishing. The, the, the definition of effortless, elegant performance. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Very and nice. speaking of performance, and with another one of my very famous, slightly tenuous connections. Yes. 
Let's go to our third car here. Now this is a 1989 Nissan Skyline, is that correct? It is a GTR. GTR. You know, it's so funny. I, I've only recently begun to appreciate these cars because to me, because of my age and everything, cars in the late 80s, early 90s, I, I think of as used cars. Be, you know, I think of them as five years old, but they're actually 30 years old. You know, and this is, of course, the car that led to the GTR we all think of today, that am, am amazing car that Nissan produced that literally, I think, changed the whole image. You know, I was not much interested in the Nissan brand after the 240Z. I thought they got, the car got sort of big and, I don't know, just kind of boring, at least from an enthusiast's point of view. And then when they brought the GTR out, that really showed their engineering prowess and, and how much horsepower they could make. And I was very impressed. So I started taking interest in these, and I really appreciate these. It's very interesting, Jay, that Nissan, for whatever reason, stepped away from performance in the United States as a part of their image, right. while pursuing it quite continuously in Japan, in their home market. And in fact, this is not the first generation of the Skyline, this is actually the third generation. And these cars, based on their production uh, mid-market models, which they did not import to the U.S. because they were still sort of doing the economy car thing in the U.S., uh, dominated Japanese touring car races. And touring car racing, to me, is one of the highest forms of competition because you really do, as a manufacturer, put your reputation on the line with cars that look exactly like the cars you sell in right. the showroom. So this is the classic example of the race on Sunday, sell on Monday uh, aspect of the cars. And these cars were absolutely unbeatable. The technology that they uh, incorporated was also quite advanced. When you think about the level of performance that they got out of a 2.6 liter engine, 276 horsepower, but prodigious torque and amazing handling. These cars well, were astonishing. The Japanese also had a gentleman's agreement, wink, wink, that they would <laughs> limit horsepower to 272 or 275. Right. Uh, these actually made closer to 312, 300. 315 horsepower, but they always had to go, oh no, it's only <laughs> 275 horsepower. And it's quite a good looking car. It looks contemporary. I mean, you could, except for a few styling cues, you could sell it as a car today. It doesn't, it doesn't appear to be of its period. Again, like the theme that we have here at Wildacre, timeless modern design. Yeah. The underslung was very modern for 1910. The Ferrari was absolutely classic and timeless for the late 1960s. And this for the late 1980s, is a very simple elemental design, the best of Japanese design with a lot, not a lot of what they call surface interest. It's the form of the car that really draws your eye. And you can now bring these into the United States because they have that 25 year and older rule. Right. You were not able to before because it didn't meet all the regulations. The, the disadvantage or advantage, depending on where you are, is to be right hand drive. That was the only part. And a lot of people feel odd shifting with the other hand, but I think it just enhances the experience. Absolutely, because this is the car that the Nissan engineers envisioned and, and built. And also the right-hand drive aspect also gives it a little bit, frankly, of prestige because you clearly know this is a Japanese domestic market or JDM product. Right. And the interesting thing too is also, for those of us that think maybe the GTR has got too complex, too much electronic gadget, so many screens, uh, you know, differential temperature, I don't really need to know all of that. This takes you back to a simpler time. It's sort of the difference between a 65 Mustang, which is basic V8 stick shift carburetor, and a modern Mustang. One is complex, one is very simple. And this has the raw elemental feel of, of that. You know, that's what I love about these. When I, the few times I've driven them, they really are quite fast. It's an impressive car. And just like the modern ones, these are also eminently tunable, yeah. which also makes them very, very, very interesting for the modern tuner crowd. And this particular example is extraordinary because it's completely original. Yeah. It's got relatively low mileage. It was imported from Japan quite recently, but is in superb condition, clearly adult owned. And that yeah. makes a big difference in these cars. A lot of them have been used very hard and thrashed. And I believe in Japan, the older your car is, the harder it is to get it on the road. Yes. You know, here in America, if you have an old car, you go down, you get an antique sticker and boom, you can drive it, you don't have to do smog checks or any of that kind of stuff. In Japan, everything, anything over five years old, it costs you more, it's more expensive, 
the price goes up, they encourage you to buy a new car. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's terrible for the old car enthusiasts in Japan. And it's also quite interesting because Japan has built some remarkable performance cars, including this uh, Skyline, but the speed limits in Japan are quite low right. and strictly enforced. Right. So enjoying a car like this must have been rather frustrating for the enthusiast when new, and actually may prove a bit frustrating for you as we go out for a drive here around Newport. Well, let's give it a shot. All right. I know it's not politically correct, but I love a non-airbag steering wheel. I love how compact it is. I love the fact that it doesn't have a huge center so I can see all the gauges and see what's happening all the time. This car is really quite lively. It's very nice. Well, it's got twin turbos, yeah. so it delivers the power in a very even way at, right. a very, at low RPMs. We're at uh, 4,000 RPM right now, and this thing feels like it's just beginning to pull. Yeah, yeah. And you realize 1989 was still not the beginning of the turbo era, but they were still finding their way. So the fact that there's hardly any turbo lag at all is really kind of fun. I, I sort of like this period where you put your foot in and you get that initial, oh, and then it takes off, you know, it's just kind of cool. Yeah, when you think about what Porsche was doing with their iconic turbo in 1989, I think this is actually much more usable power uh, than the contemporary Porsche had. And to me, this is kind of like, I, I'm trying to find an American equivalent. I, it's almost like a Ford Falcon or a Chevy Nova with a 289 or a 327 in it. It looks like a little Japanese car, well, this but is, it's got this monster motor. Well, this is the, again, this is the midline of the Nissan. This is sold in the Prince dealerships. Right. So this was the, um, before the whole second brand, the, the Lexus Infinity thing, this was an upmarket Nissan right. coupe. And this is sort of a, a luxury car, almost a personal luxury car um, in the Nissan line at the time. And to give it this kind of performance really elevated it to a new level. Yeah, because Nissan was not performance oriented at the time. Remember the Tonight Show, I did a joke, Nissan on an ad where they never showed the car. They just showed rocks and trees and they talked. You remember that? Ah, uh, yes, the, the introduction of Infinity. Right, where right. Where you didn't know what they were selling. It could right. be a timeshare at a resort somewhere in right, Big Sur. Right. But I remember the joke <laughs> I said was it didn't help the sales of cars, but garden centers say rocks and tree sales through the roof. They were going crazy. <laughs> And I got like a nasty letter, I got an angry letter, you know, by the way. But it was kind of funny. And I just think this gets back to the root of what automobiles are about, performance and handling. I mean, it's very nice. And although 275, really 300 horsepower, doesn't seem like a lot today, the car is so light that it's more the equivalent of 400 horsepower, I think. Exactly, Jay. I mean, it's all about usable performance. Um, whether it's the underslung, the Ferrari 330, or this, it's about having performance that you can use in all situations. On a road like this with, with fairly low speed limits, on the open road, or even on the track. And there we go, turbo! And also we have to remember that this car has very, very, very sophisticated suspension. It says all wheel steering. Right. And it was also all wheel drive. Right. Rear wheel all steering. Wheel drive. I didn't know that. I thought it was uh, rear wheel drive only. Think about the performance cars of that period, like the Lancia Delta Integrale, right. the great, right. the Audi Quattro. They were really looking at things that had been utilitarian and looking at using them for performance purposes. Although, right. of course, as you well know, four wheel drive was not new in the 1980s. Right. It was the first four wheel drive car? It was like 19. Uh, Oh, nine thing, the Spiker, I think it was the first four-wheel drive car. Spiker was the first yeah. four-wheel drive car, yeah, yeah, I believe that's true. And of course, the American Eagle was the first American, I think, made by Jeep, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, uh, it's also very interesting to watch the, uh, the boost gauge, because of those twin turbos, the boost engages at fairly low RPM. Right. I know a lot of people get freaked out driving on the right side. I don't, I don't really find it any different. Well, a lot of people also say that for instance, uh, a lot of Italian cars of uh, the upper class of sporting cars in the 1930s, like Alfa Romeos and Lanchas, were all right-hand drive, and Lancia was right-hand drive right. up until the mid-50s. Right. And many people say that it was a lot easier to drive a car like that on a mountain road. You could place it more easily because you knew where the end of the road was gotcha. and uh, it gave you an added security. In passing, it makes it a little dicier if you're driving uh, right. in a left-hand drive environment in a right-hand drive car. You either have to have a spotter or you have to be very adventurous.
You know, one of the other things, of course, this is a very, very good example of one of these cars, but the build quality is really terrific. You know, it's, it's a very solid feeling car. Right. There's no rattles or shakes. You know, all the things that you think about a Japanese performance car, this really sort of puts the lie to that. And it's performance you can use. You can use all of it all the time. It's very nice. It's always great when a car that has a legendary reputation can live up to it. Funny, I'm looking for the turn signal on this side. <laughs> yeah, I remember quite well the first time I drove a right-hand drive car, I was on vacation in South Africa. And every time I went to uh, use the turn signal, I put the windshield wipers on, yeah. which was very embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, by the time you get to uh, this, the windshield wiper controls are on the dashboard, so yeah. you don't have that issue. It's also interesting looking at the ergonomics of this car. They really made an effort to try to make it very driver-centric. You know, in front of me as the passenger, there's absolutely nothing. There's open space. And you've got there on the dashboard all the controls for the radio right. or the lights, everything right there on the instrument pinnacle, so you can literally keep your hands on the wheel and touch the controls. You know, a lot of times a car like this is not the performance so much is the way it makes you feel. Like to me, I love driving my MG Midget because it feels fast. It's not right. fast at all. <laughs> but you just, oh, you're sort of having fun and you're engaged and you're shifting and moving things and you're know, pressing, uh, you know, clutches and brakes and everything sort of clicks in. You you're know? involved all you the know, time. This is a I think very that's involving car to yeah. drive, which is to me what makes it fun. Now, it doesn't pass one test. What's that? For me, at least. The uh, seat to height of door sill ratio is wrong. I can't lean my elbow on the yeah, door. Yeah, it's a little, that's yeah. to me, that was my biggest problem with the new Camaro, you know, it was always up here. But these are very comfortable seats as well. You know, a lot of modern sports seats make you feel that they're giving you a kidney massage. Right. And these are, are first of all, they're cloth seats, which I think is absolutely yeah. the best because cloth seats hold you in place. Right. And a nice cloth seat, nicely shaped. Yeah. You know, this is a seat that you can, spend a lot of time in. Yeah, you can drive right. this car for hours and not uh, get tired. And also, it's a very funny thing. I love radios in cars, and especially vintage radios in cars. And one of the things that drives me slightly crazy is when a car has been used as an everyday car and they update the radio. Yeah, And they yeah. put a radio like this, 1980s radio, with all of this graphics, but it fits perfectly here. I hate this is where it was born. Hey, buddy, how about your selection? Yes. Would you choose it again? <laughs> yes. Shut up. I just, oh, <laughs> just like, want to hear tunes. Oh, oh I, the one I hate the most, I like to reach over, just turn the volume up or turn it down. I hate holding a button and go beep, 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 I have to go up and down the scale. I have to look at it to see where it is, you know. I hate the fact that I, I like the old Becker Grand Prix. Ah, yes, exactly. You just. Two knobs and a button. Yeah, two knobs and a button. Just reach over, bang, bang. That's one of the things, actually, I do have to say, however, for a performance car, now granted, we're driving around with the windows down, there's not much sound of the engine. I don't well, know if that's a matter of the engine or the exhaust. Well, I guess you could fix that fairly easy. Yeah. You know, Japan is a quiet place. Right. I mean, you don't hear open pipe Harleys and stuff when you're in Tokyo, you know? So I think the idea is it's to be polite and, you know, you're in such a crowded environment, the whole country, that you want to be conscious of your neighbor. I mean, Japanese are wearing face masks they had a common cold just because they didn't right. want to give it to anyone else, you know. Got a bit of that turbine, that, that turbo wine. Yeah, yeah. Which is nice. It's so funny, I just don't think of cars from this period as vintage. But they are vintage because it's simple, it's easy to work on. Um, the turbos are the most complicated aspect to it. You've got a proper gearbox, you're involved in it. It's really very, very nice to drive. Uh, you know, the sad thing is, the manual transmission is all but gone. I think only Porsche and Corvette are the only people doing it, wouldn't you say? Isn't that about right? That's absolutely right. Although the interesting thing is as well that there will be a comeback. How it will manifest itself remains to be seen. But I think there will be a comeback because there is a demand for an involved driving experience. I know, um, but not as much of a demand. You know, the only when you talk to car manufacturers, the only people that <laughs> ask about a manual are car journalists and people who aren't going to buy one anyway. You know, <laughs> uh, that is that is the uh, that is the uh, the conundrum. But yeah. I still think that in places where manufacturers can find out 
as manufacturing evolves, that they can make smaller batches of special cars. I think right. that's where you'll see it. Yeah. yeah There'll be cars for specialists in small batches. And it will be something that suits the car and its personality and its character. I think that's what we've seen in everything we've looked at today. The fact that the house, Wild Acre, is designed to fit its environment exactly. Yeah. The American underslung use technology to advance its missions. The Ferrari is just absolutely timeless in style, simple in doing its job. And the Skyline led the way in Japanese performance and today is recognized as a classic. Yeah, and I like the Japanese understatement. Not a lot of stripes, not a lot of GTRs all over it. It doesn't say performance. It just it delivers performance. Just delivers performance. Very good. Well, I say we should uh, take this thing and go deliver us some lunch somewhere. And, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. That's an idea. And we'll come back next week with some more cars. See you later, you guys.